Alrighty, hello there everyone. We are here to take 100 steps for every like I got on a video I uploaded a bit over a month ago. I'm gonna go ahead and put this uh, GoPro on top of my head and we'll get underway and I'll explain what we're doing here. So a bit over a month ago, I uploaded a video saying that I would take uh, one step for every like that I got on uh, a video raising awareness about the effects of nuclear war. And my goal was to get enough likes that I would be able to take enough steps to have some realistic chance of surviving a nuclear bomb if it would land, if it would land in my city. Um, needless to say, I did not get as many likes as I expected. Uh, so to make this somewhat of an interesting video, I decided I would just take 100 steps for every like that I got, uh, which is for 48 likes. Uh, that's 4,800 steps. So here I am in lovely Parramatta, walking along the Parramatta River here, and gonna take 4,800 steps. Uh, I think that should take me about 30 to 40 minutes, we'll see. And we can talk a bit about uh, nuclear war. Now, some of you have sent in questions, uh, which I'm happy to, to chat about. And I've got a list of things I want to talk about as well. So uh, why don't we have a look at the list? I think I've got some uh, facts I just wanted to read off bef um, before we get into any questions. Uh, by the way, this is all a bit experimental. I'm recording audio on the GoPro uh, at the same time as on my phone. So uh, I'm going to try and splice that together later. I haven't done that before. We'll see how that goes. Um, but all right, well, the first question was, uh, oh, actually, sorry, I am going to, I said I'm going to read out some facts first. Now, if, uh, if anything gets too noisy while we're walking here, uh, of course, it's a weekday and people are out and about doing, uh, you know, all sorts of things, construction, living their life. If things get too noisy, uh, I'll probably just cut the audio later and split, like add it in with um, some fresh audio, so. Cool. Well, firstly, how many nuclear weapons are there in the world right now? Um, the number has actually gone down in the last uh, 30, 40 years from its peak, which is excellent. It's currently at about 13,100 nuclear weapons in the world. It'll depend a little bit on how you count it, whether you count active nuclear weapons only or whether you also count inactive weapons. There are quite a number that are inactive um, currently, but could be reassembled. There are, there are currently nine countries with nuclear weapons, which I think was one of the uh, first questions we had from YouTube. Now, um, another question was, uh, how many countries have had nuclear weapons donated to them? Um, so to my knowledge, this was actually a quite a tricky question to get a clear answer on. To my knowledge, no countries have had nuclear weapons donated to them, but I am aware that Iran uh, was able to secure help, I believe, from Russia, maybe China. Let me just check my, get my facts straight here. Um, uh, right, I can't find where I saw that now, but uh, in any case, um, I believe Iran was able to get support from Russia and maybe China to develop their nuclear weapons program. Um, although not, no, none, no nuclear weapons have been donated specifically to my knowledge. Um, but uh, let's continue on with these facts. So there are 22 countries, nine countries with nukes currently, 22 countries with weapons usable nuclear materials that are potentially vulnerable to theft, which of course is a big concern uh, at the moment, um, thankfully, to, to the degree we can say that, only nation states have nuclear weapons. Um, and we'll talk about mutually assured destruction later, but there is a sort of a status quo that has prevented nuclear weapons from being used in combat since uh, 1945. Now, if a terrorist groups were to get their hands on any kind of nuclear weapons, it's unlikely that mutually assured destruction would uh, prevent them from using it, which of course is a major concern of many people working on this issue. Um, but uh, I think specifically the commenter on YouTube also wants to know uh, which countries specifically have nuclear weapons, so that would be currently 
Russia, the United States, China, France, the UK, Pakistan, India, Israel, and North Korea. I stand corrected, at least on uh, Iran doesn't currently have nuclear weapons, it seems. But uh, look, I'll fact check that one later. If, I'm, if I was incorrect that they at least have received help in de developing a nuclear weapons program, I will uh, correct this later. Um, but to my knowledge, that is correct. So they must have received help and not actually developed any nuclear weapons. Well, anyway, we're progressing here along the, the Parramatta River. I think we'll be mostly along the Parramatta River for, for most of this walk. Um, if we run out of path along the river, then uh, we may step off into the side streets. Uh, well, that's all the, the general facts I wanted to read out. And uh, I did recently see the Oppenheimer movie, so I wanted to talk about that a little bit. But first, I'm uh, being paranoid. I'm going to check that I am actually recording. Uh, yes, excellent. Apologies, bear with me for one moment. Mm. In my last video, I um, uh, forgot to turn on my audio recording and just got a silent video, so that was a bit devastating. I'm a bit paranoid now. Um, right, well, yes, I just saw the Oppenheimer movie last week and uh, enjoyed that very much. Finally got around to seeing that. Um, it, uh, it was a, the movie was more about the, I guess, the, uh, the structures in place around how the weapons were developed rather than... Um, I thought it might be more about the, the war itself. But it was much more about the scientists than I expected at least. I thought it was a very good movie and I did learn some things, especially um, about the Manhattan Project and about the Trinity test, the, fir the, uh, the first nuclear weapons explosion was... Uh, of course, as part of the Manhattan Project, they, the first weapon they, when they tested the first nuclear bomb, that was the Trinity test, and then they went on to uh, drop two on Japan at Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Um, quite a depressing movie, and uh, it seems like, if you believe the movie at least, after the fact Oppenheimer seemed to uh, regret his actions to an extent and was advocating against the development of the more advanced um, H-bomb, which uh, most nuclear weapons today are, if not all perhaps, are based on that design rather than the original A-bomb, uh, atomic bomb. Um, well, I, uh, in terms of other fictional medium that, uh, well, not that Oppenheimer's fictional, in terms of other uh, movies and TV series, I, I mean to say, uh, I've also seen, I also watched Fallout recently, and Fallout's a game, if you're not aware, which is about uh, society several hundred years after a global thermonuclear war. And the society that emerges from the vaults and the ruins. And it's a long standing video game series, which I've enjoyed, um, and now became a TV show. And I believe season two will be on its way at some point. Here's the. Uh, the ferry that goes to goes to the Sydney CBD, um, and I enjoyed that one as well. That one's set several hundred years in the future, so it's an interesting mix of like, uh, well, when the war, when the nuclear war takes place, I think it was something like the 20, 2060s or 2070s. So somewhat in the future from now is when the war breaks out. Um, uh, but it's an interesting mix of like retro technology. Um, and like futuristic technology. So you got robots, but then also everyone's watching black and white TVs and got the old green text computer terminals. Um, and something really interesting I wanted to talk about about this movie, and spoiler alert, of course, if you haven't seen it, sorry, the Fallout series, not movie. The, uh, the this company called vault Tech, they build and develop uh, and maintain, operates maybe as well. Um, nuclear fallout shelters, like quite large ones that seem to house up to a hundred, several hundred people per shelter. And mostly it's for the rich and powerful who can buy a spot in one of these shelters. Um, now, uh, 
I guess it's a conflict of interest or maybe just a financial incentive to want the fear of nuclear war of your vault tech because if there's no fear of nuclear war, if there's no impending threat of nuclear war, or indeed if there's just no nuclear weapons, uh, you don't have a very compelling market case. People aren't going to want to buy spots in your vault and you won't make much money. Now, uh, so in the movie, as it turns out, vault tech were the ones that seems to have dropped the first bomb, starting off a uh, retaliatory strike from... Well, I forget where they dropped it or if they even said, but they if, I suppose they dropped it on America. Um, they, uh, well, America would have retaliated against the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union would have retaliated against America, and then it's all over. And they get what they wanted, I guess. Um, but it was interesting. I mean, I guess in the end it turned out that they wanted to build a new world with them in charge, and that's what the vaults were for. Um, but if it was just the financial incentive to, you know, get, they'd, they'd want to maintain this balance between not quite nuclear war, but nuclear war being a realistic possibility. Um, otherwise, well, the money's not good, much good to them if if everyone's dead and society is over, even if some of them survive in the vaults. But we had a grander plan after that, as it turned out. <clears throat> Anyway, that was a I recommend that series and those games if anyone is interested. And another movie I wanted to talk about was War Games, which there was a Matthew Broderick movie from, gosh, like the 1980s, maybe 1990s, 70s. I'm not sure exactly. But that's a movie when I that I saw quite at quite a young age um, about uh, an artificial intelligence uh, taking control of the U.S. nuclear weapons missile program and. So basically, it was the AI was designed to run war games to help the U.S. military find the best outcome. In the end, uh, it was about to launch an entire it was about to launch a preemptive strike, believing that the best way, the only way to win against the Russians or the Soviet Union was to launch a preemptive strike against them um, uh, and hopefully wipe them out before they can retaliate. So, uh, and then in the end, it's. Um, they got the AI to play tic-tac-toe with itself over and over again until it realized that, you know, if, there's, if two people are perfectly good at tic-tac-toe, which doesn't take that much skill, um, then there's no way to win, you can only draw. Which is true. And so they got the AI to play tic-tac-toe against itself until it realized that uh, the only way to win tic-tac-toe is to not play. And so the only way to win nuclear war is to not play. <laughs> anyway. Uh, We'll talk about AI a little bit later as well, and how AI, artificial general intelligence, artificial super intelligence, might affect the future of nuclear war and mutually assured destruction. But let's move on a little bit to um, uh, some real, some real uh, things in recent history now about the use of nuclear weapons or near misses. So as I mentioned, nuclear weapons have only been used in combat twice. There have been tests. There have been some close calls in terms of accidents and in terms of, I guess, what you could call them maybe political misunderstandings. Um, so, of course, I'm talking about uh, the incidents with Vasily Arkhipov during the Cuban Missile Crisis and Stanislav Petrov, maybe, what was that, 15, 20 years later in the 1980s, I think, um, with a false alarm. So, first, uh, Vasily Arkhipov was a, I've made a video on him relatively recently, he was a, uh, an officer on a submarine uh, during the Cuban Missile Crisis um, and uh, they had a nuclear torpedo on board which the US didn't know at the time. Uh, Soviet officer if I didn't mention, I may have. Um, and uh, his, his commanding officer, the, uh, the captain of the submarine, wanted to... We, so they lost radio communication, they were being depth charged by the US and as far as they knew, a nuclear war had already broken out. So the captain wanted to launch a nuclear torpedo against, uh, I think it was a US aircraft carrier, or a large US ship at least. And um, uh, if they had done so, there was a reasonable chance that that might have sparked retaliation up until the point of nuclear war. Um, and Vasily Arkhipov, having, uh, I suppose, veto power on the use of that nuclear weapon on that submarine, um, refused and uh, well it turned out he was right <laughs> I mean nuclear war had not broken out so 
That was a near miss, I guess you could say. That we've come surprisingly close to nuclear war at least several times, more close than many people think, I, I suspect. The second time was Stanislav Petrov in the 1980s was a missile commander. And there was uh, some false information from their monitoring system that suggested that the, nuclear, the US had launched a nuclear strike, first strike against Russia. Um, and uh, well, it looked like one or several missiles had been launched. And so uh, Petrov, uh, who had the say at the time, argued for, he, did, he made the decision not to retaliate, even though that was the protocol was launched an immediate and full retaliatory strike. I guess that's the whole point of um, mutually assured destruction. If you don't do that, then there's no mutually assured destruction. So you kind of have to pre-commit to doing that. Um, which is an interesting but troubling concept. But uh, in any case, he decided not to because he argued that, well, a first strike of a few missiles doesn't really make much sense. If you're going to launch a first strike, you'd launch everything. So he, they didn't retaliate. And uh, in the end, it turned out to be uh, failure of their monitoring system. Um, all very troubling stuff because uh, now you have to wonder uh, what happens if, I mean, if someone wants to launch a first strike, maybe they'd launch a few nukes because <laughs> they were, they, maybe they think the other, the other side is going to think that. And then, you know, and so on down the chain of decision making until, you know, it's, it's all over. Um, so, look, those two people are heroes, in my opinion. They may have saved, saved most of us, if not all of us. Um, and a couple of accidents as well. So there was, a, in 1961, the a, a Goldsboro incident, B-52 bomber crashed, which was carrying two 3.8 megaton nukes. Um, so information declassified since 2013 showed that it was credible to nuclear weapons engineers that that could have conceivably resulted in the detonation of those nuclear weapons, and that plane crashed on US home soil, uh, North Carolina, I believe. So that's really concerning. And then in 1966, another B-52 carrying four nukes crashed. Um, uh, gosh, let me see if I can remember where this was. It was uh, off the coast of Spain or in near Spain, something like that. It was a, I think it was a mid-air refueling operation went wrong. Um, so look, there have been some accidents and some close calls, and I think the moral of the story is we've come much closer to nuclear war than I think most people think. Um, so I, I want to get on to talking about living in fear of nuclear weapons because there's, it was the era, I think, the classic era people think of when you think of living in fear of nuclear war, which is probably the 1960s, where, you know, people talked, would talk about uh, nuclear fallout shelters and taking shelter, uh, school children taking shelter, those educational videos for school children in the US. And uh, the, in the UK, I know this is a fear, I'm sure across Europe and in the Soviet Union as well. Um, but I, I'd say I still live, I, I live in fear of that today. Um, probably first time I felt that fear to any great degree was um, when North Korea launched a missile over Japan or a rocket. Um, uh, and North Korea developing their nuclear weapons program. And uh, recent events with Russia and Ukraine are not helping that fear. With Putin uh, every now and then reminding people that they might threaten nuclear war. So uh, it's, it's very troubling to me, and that's, you know, it's. Uh, you know, the last, uh, what, 70, wow, 80 years almost now since the first nuclear weapons. Um, last 80 years, has, this has been pretty much the first time that we might all be able to, to kill each other <laughs> uh, without a conventional ground war that spans the whole planet. Even that's a bit ludicrous to think about. So these are, these are interesting and troubling times. I want to, want to talk about some, some things I've read about uh, what to do in the event of a nuclear explosion. Because it's all well and good to be afraid, but I think, you know, there's, the, there's, there's, there's um, being overly afraid and scared of things. And then I think there's being pragmatic. And I think, 
I'd like to think that my fear is pragmatic because I think about you know, things like, should I get a survival kit, emergency survival kit in my house? I probably should, I have not done that yet. We had one in Japan for the, in the, when we lived there in the event of earthquakes and tsunamis, but uh, don't have that yet, probably should. But some other things that I think would, are good to know and be aware of without needing to make much change in your life. So if you do see, if there is a, I mean, there are some things you can do to increase your chances of surviving a nuclear blast. So one is, if you see a sudden flash in the sky, which is bright or as bright, as bright or brighter than the sun, what you should do is uh, assume it's a nuclear explosion, turn away from the flash and run for cover. That's most of, uh, step number one. Um, and then seek shelter to avoid, avoid the blast wave, which will come after that flash. Uh, depending how far away you are, that might take seconds to maybe a minute or so. Um, so seek, seek shelter, and then in terms of, in order of most preferable to least preferable, a reinforced bunker, and a basement, fire stairs, a uh, small bathroom at ground level, laundry with brick walls would be at least preferable. And then, I mean, if all of that fails, something, anything, anything solid is better than nothing. Putting one of the main things to the way the main ways to think about this is you want to put something solid between you and the and the source of the flash, the, the explosion. If you can do that, then you've increased your chance of survival. Um, then uh, you want to so of course you want to avoid the side of the building closest to the blast. Then lie down next to a sturdy table, bed or sofa, and not under. This applies for earthquakes as well, and I guess it's something that maybe not many people know about. Um, you know, a lot of people have the conventional wisdom of hiding underneath something like furniture. But you want to hide next to the furniture, so next to your bed, next to a table, uh, next to a couch, not under. And the reason being, if there's a collapse, the, the weight of the ceiling collapsing might crush the furniture, but it might create an air pocket next to the furniture, and that's kind of what you're going for. You want to be in that air pocket rather than under the furniture, which might get crushed by the, the roof. Um, keep away from glass and tall furniture, of course. Uh, keep your jaw open to keep your eardrum pressure equal during the blast wave. Gosh, I doubt I'd ever remember to do this in the event. That's probably going to be the last thing on my mind, but if you can remember to do that, that's great. Um, and then if you, do, if you decide to shelter in place after that, make sure you block all the doors, windows and air gaps to avoid radiation getting in from fallout. Uh, don't drink rainwater, but in theory, intact pipes, water pipes should be okay. So you're, well, depending on where you live in the world, but your regular water taps are probably fine. Um, as long as the pipes are intact. Use a dust mask or similar. Um, just, I just wear that all the time, to be honest, inside to avoid breathing in radiative, uh, radi radiated particles. Uh, and then make sure you decontaminate if you get home, let's say, decontaminate by scrubbing your skin, nails, hair, etc. Change into clean clothing. Don't wear that, the clothing you wore uh, when you were out again. Um, and shelter in place. And I mean, besides being more prepared, besides ch changing where you live, that's probably the best you can do. Um, well, at least I think those are the main steps. And I think that would definitely increase your chance of survival. I think I've gotten to Parap Manor Park here, or close enough. Uh, so I'm going to take a quick break just to check how many steps I've done so far. If I can find my uh, health app. So we started in about 1300, and we're aiming for uh, 6100, I think, steps. Um, looks like we're about halfway, actually. I uh, thought we'd made it further than that, so. Well, good, let's keep going. Let's see what else is on my list of things to talk about. So this concept of mutually assured destruction, right, let's get into that. The idea is, if two countries have an arsenal of nuclear weapons, each country's arsenal being big enough to uh, completely or close to completely wipe out the other country, 
in theory, the, the game theory is that neither country will use their nuclear weapons because if one country uses their nuclear weapons, the other country will immediately and completely retaliate. And so both countries are destroyed, neither country wins. And that's what I was talking about before during, in the context of the War Games movie, the AI realizing that the best way to win is not to play at all. Now, um, there are some arguments as to why that's been a good thing. So, the, some argue that conventional wars are down. Conventional land wars, um, between nuclear powers at least, haven't really happened in a while. Uh, it's not to say that they won't, but that seems to be one potential advantage. Um, uh, so, but of course there are downsides. I mean, I've talked about some of the near misses and the accidents. If that one of those, so I, I wanted to I point out earlier with the with that those B-52s, the the one that landed in North Carolina and crashed. Um, some uh, the oh no, I can't remember if I did mention this or not, but I'll mention it again. The um, nuclear weapons engineers uh, who wrote about this uh, reviewed this incident in about 2013. Some information was made declassified which said that uh, they thought it was plausible that under the right scenario, the right circumstances, that the nuclear weapon could have detonated, one of the two nuclear weapons. <clears throat> now, if a nuclear weapon detonates on North American soil, uh, on US soil, they, uh, they, might, <laughs> they might panic and think that it's a first strike, um, and they might retaliate against who they perceived to have launched them, which would be the, the Soviet Union at the time. Um, so, even if mutually assured destruction works in theory, it doesn't really protect you from accidents and the Vasily Arkhipov and Stanislav Petrov scenarios I mentioned. Um, now, uh, we've, we've, as I mentioned, we've, we've come down from the peak of number of nuclear weapons in the world, which is a good start. Uh, but there's a worry that one of the downsides of um, disarmament, if we get close to full disarmament, is we lose that deterrence and we lose that uh, positive effect on uh, conventional wars between nuclear powers. But as we get closer to complete disarmament, uh, we don't really, we might stop having that volume of nuclear weapons that you'd need for complete mutually assured destruction. Or well, if each country has one nuclear weapon, then you certainly don't. So then maybe the, uh, the risk of one country using one of those nuclear weapons goes up and the other country drops their nuclear bomb too. And now you just got two countries with a nuclear bomb dropped on each of them. Um, so I don't know. Uh, one would have to weigh up, the, weigh up the risks, the benefits of disarmament to different degrees. And I'm not, I'm not an expert on that. And I won't say any more about that. Um, but uh, another factor which I know is going to uh, probably affect the concept of mutually assured destruction. Uh, first of all, I'm going to talk about AI in a sec, but first of all I want to talk about this, uh, this um, program that was known as Star Wars, not the movie. Um, this was a US defense program. I'm not even going to try and guess when this was. Um, uh, sometime when the Soviet Union was still around. Um, so Star Wars was, a, was the code name for this program that was going to develop a point defense system to shoot down any incoming Soviet Union inter intercontinental ballistic missiles coming from Russia to the US. It was gonna, it was gonna be set up to be able to shoot them down. Now, sounds like an okay idea in theory. Here are the problems with this. Uh, if, um, 
if now it's, it's, it'll be impossible for the system to be completely foolproof which you'd want it to be if you're going to rely on it because if only one percent of those nuclear weapons gets through you miss one percent through your point defense system uh, you're screwed anyway um, so I guess you don't want to rely on it uh, if it's not going to be foolproof, which it can't be. <coughs> and suppose the US is developing this uh, Star Wars program. Well, if the Russia sees this, uh, they, what are they going to think? They're going to think, oh, in five years when they finish this program, we won't be able to uh, launch an effective strike on them anymore. And so we're losing this ability to retaliate if the US has a first strike against us. So we're losing that concept of mutually assured destruction. So maybe we need to become more aggressive now. Maybe we need to invade the US. Maybe we need to launch a first strike ourselves because we're going to lose that ability to do so. And what would stop the US from launching a first strike against us? I mean, that might be what the Soviet Union thinks. So it's a pretty flawed concept. Um, yeah, anyway. Uh, okay, AI. Well, AI might do the same thing because uh, as we approach artificially general intelligence, and I've been reading more about this recently in the wake of um, uh, Leopold Aschenbrenner's uh, Situational Awareness Report. He was uh, one of the staff at OpenAI working on AI safety, and he's made some projections about what he thinks. Um, the next 10 years are going to look like is if AI trends continue, like the development of AI capabilities continue. We're going to quickly get to, in his view, artificial general intelligence, artificial super intelligence. Once you get to AGI, as long as you have an AI that can uh, develop itself as effectively as an AI developer, AI researcher, well, it's going to do that. It's going to do that uh, hundreds of times more fast, quickly, and more efficiently. And then it's just going to keep developing itself, and that is going to keep developing itself, and so on. And that's how you get artificial superintelligence. Artificial superintelligence almost certainly won't be built by humans. Um, humans will set the wheels in motion, then AI will take, take care of it from there. Uh, so look, um, he talks about this, uh, this the, the international security risks, one of which is as AI becomes more developed, eventually you might get the capability for swarm technology, small drones, which might um, uh, be able to do some of what Star that Star Wars program was capable of, a point defense system. And well, if you, if you have that on the horizon, regardless of whether it's guaranteed to happen or not, if it's just plausible, that might have the same effect as the Star Wars program of causing uh, them to launch a first strike. If they, if, if, especially if the uh, AI capabilities are extremely lopsided between different countries. If the US develops this uh, swarm technology with AI, uh, Soviet Union or China, sorry, not Soviet Union now, Russia, might, uh, might launch a first strike or become increasingly aggressive. Uh, and vice versa, if it's a different country that gets that capability first. And the, the, the risk is with the, I mean, with, AI, with, point, with the Star Wars system, it was a, a slower development process. But with AI, with hard takeoff scenarios, you could quickly get into, you could quickly go from very little swarm technology capability to a lot of it. So it's hard to, hard to predict and hard to act accordingly. It's, yeah, it's troubling to me as well. Um, All right, uh, I want to talk about as, as well about just the general trend of the increased capability of one person or, well, the, the increased capability certainly of one person to cause more destruction and death than at any point in history, and that's only increasing. I think um, 500 years ago, the best someone could do is be really good with a sword or a bow. <clears throat> um, one person personally, could only kill so many people before being overwhelmed. Then, then you've got the rifle, uh, and someone could plausibly kill more people. And then you've got um, semi-automatic and automatic 
uh, weaponry. Then you've got planes with bombs, and now one person can kill many people. And then you got now we've got nuclear bombs, and so one person has more power to cause damage and harm than ever before. And I mean, you've got other things like uh, artificial engineered pandemics. Um, so that's just a general trend that I think is increasing over time. Anyway, um, I, uh, I started reading this book called Dark Skies, I think by Daniel Duedney. It's about uh, some of the downsides of space, de space technology development, space exploration. And uh, one of the main ones, I've, I'm yet to finish the book, I'm still quite early in it, but uh, and I will be making a video about that at some point when I finish it and have a chance to think about it some more. But one of the things they talk about is um, uh, just the increased, I mean, as we worked on getting to space, we developed rocket technology and you can get to space with rockets. What else can you do with that? You can, you can develop international continental, uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles and you can put nukes on them. So I, I guess they're arguing that, uh, sorry, Daniel, if I'm putting words in your mouth, but I suppose they're arguing um, our development of space technology has led to increased nuclear weapons capabilities as well. Um, and I think they've got a point, <clears throat> to an extent. I don't know what extent. <clears throat> so the question is how much of that, I mean, how, how, how much can we separate these things? How, I mean, would the, would that, would we develop that technology anyway to launch ICBMs without the space development? I mean, if we can imagine we didn't have a space race and we didn't have any development of um, rockets for space exploration, would we develop that ICBM technology anyway? And again, I, I mean, just something I thought of just then, how, uh, to what extent can we separate them when there might have been, I mean, look, I, I probably should know more about the space race, so I'm going to say something completely off the hook and uh, unfact checked here, but what if it were the case that part of the motivation for the space race was increasing this capability anyway, under the guise, maybe thinly veiled guise of a space race, of, of trying to get to the moon first. Um, so stay tuned on that. I look forward to finishing that Dark Skies book soon and making a video on that. I am just going to quickly check my steps again. I've got about 1,200 steps to go. So just over a third of the way, I think. Sorry, just over two thirds of the way. Well, um, I've almost exhausted uh, the topics I wanted to talk about, so I've got through that quicker than I expected. So I want to conclude by uh, just talking about the Nuclear Threat Initiative, because they're an organization that I um, mentioned in the original video uh, that sparked this one. They're an organization that works on reducing the risk of nuclear war, but also other, uh, other things like, uh, I think, uh, biological threats, um, engineer pandemics. Uh, and so they're doing good work, and I would like to encourage you to look into their work, at least in terms of, in terms of education, at least, or if not, to support them. And of course, I pledge that every cent I make on that original video, and I pledge that for this video as well, every cent I make on this video in perpetuity, will be donated to the Nuclear Threat Initiative. Um, so, yeah, I don't have too much more to say about them other than to encourage you to at least look at their resources. And they're, a, they're an excellent source. Um, well, uh, I've been going mostly in a straight line from here and I'm going to have um, my location on a map, kind of as we walk here, so you can see where I'm up to. Now, to come back to where this video started, I mentioned that my goal here was to try and take enough steps to uh, increase my chance of survival in a nuclear war. <laughs> uh, 4,800 steps is not very much. It's not gonna make a difference, really. But there was a, just a useful 
way to, I guess, have this opportunity to like get the spark of the conversation, get some interest maybe, and talk about these things. Um, now I've been going mostly in a straight line, more or less, since we started. I think I'm starting to curve around here. I think I've come to the end of the line, so you might have to use your imagination and pretend I'm still walking in a straight uh, away from the blast location, which I'm pretending is um, Sydney CBD, downtown Sydney. Um, and I'm going to start to curve around here, I think. <clears throat> If I sound a little puffed, it's probably because I am. I um, unfortunately had a pretty major back injury. Uh, let's see, about two and a bit months ago now. Um, I sneezed of all things and completely threw my back out by sneezing in a weird position with a, I had a pre-existing back injury and had a disc bulge, if not from the sneeze, then they aggravated an existing disc bulge from a previous injury. Um, so I'm pretty unfit at the moment. I'm just kind of when really you just started going back to the gym a few weeks ago after being cleared by my physio uh, If you're here to listen about nuclear war, then it's uh, probably isn't very relevant for you <laughs> um, but uh, I mean w One of the motivations for this video was originally one of the many motivations was force me to get more active uh, Because for a while at least walking was the only exercise that I could do I'm uh, getting back to other forms of exercise now, late weightlifting, so not as much of a motivator now, but that was part of, part of my motivation when I started this. Um, <clears throat> yeah, well, uh, you can see here, that's Parramatta CBD. And it uh, looks like we're getting, we're getting back on track. We're going to keep walking through Parramatta Park here. It's also kind of cool. I'm exploring some places in my neighborhood I haven't really been to yet, having moved here a few months ago. Um, look, I probably won't talk too much more unless I have something to say. So why don't we just enjoy the walk, enjoy the view. Uh, and uh, we'll check back in once we get to our 4,800 steps. My uh, wireless microphone setup battery is getting a bit low. But rather than turn it off, I guess if, uh, if it runs out, then I will rely on the GoPro microphone. That was a pretty useless update, but you're welcome. Just for fun, because I'm skipping the gym today, I'm going to do some pull-ups on that pull-up bar over there. 
which of course in the event of a nuclear war I would not be doing, needless to say. But we're just kind of, I'm just kind of yellowing it right now. Hashtag, this is content. Let's, uh, let's follow this path over here. I have no idea where I am. <laughs> I've never been here before. I think we're on the other side of Parramatta Park right now. From Parramatta. Maybe near Westmead. It's a pretty nice walk. I'm gonna, I see ducks down by the river. I'm gonna go check them out after on my way back. Got about 400 steps left. One hundred steps to go. Uh, apparently, I haven't really calibrated this, so not very accurate in the slightest, probably. But apparently, I've burned two hundred and forty-seven kilocalories.
expecting this to update any second now. As soon as that gets to three, uh, 6,400, we're going to call it done. Oh, I think I might have... That may be 100 steps more than I intended to, but that's... I won't tell if you don't. Well, that's it folks, 6,421 steps. Well, when I get home, I'm going to uh, record a nice little view of the map for you so you can see where we walk to and we can look at the blast radius calculator, <laughs> the damage calculator of a nuclear bomb dropped in Sydney. Um, it's, I probably have not survived, uh, but uh, I wanna thank you all for sticking with me this far if you did. Uh, or we skipped ahead to the end, that's fine. Um, I'm going to walk home and we'll have a bit of a chat there. But uh, thank you for, for joining me while I rambled about nuclear war. Uh, it's been fun. So all the best. See ya.